and uh, I hope you're looking forward to this afternoon's session. I'm very pleased to welcome the first speaker. Uh, as this morning, we'll have 30 minutes for the talk and then 15 minutes for questions. So do please uh, think about your questions as we go through. And our first speaker is Professor Maria Clara Nucci from the University of Bologna in search of hidden symmetries. Thank you. Um, let me give you an outline of what I'm talking about. This is going to be whoever was this morning is going to be a completely different type of talk since I am uh, a mathematical physicist, but I'm actually more, well, what am I more? More a mathematician sometime. With the physicist, I'm a mathematician. With the theoretical I'm a mathematician, I'm an applied te technician, whatever. They ask me to repair light bulb usually. Okay. First of all, I better introduce what I'm talking about. When I talk about searching for hidden symmetry, I better tell you which symmetries. Um, an example, I would make an example because I, it's an example I like very much since it was made famous by a movie years ago and so everybody knows about it, maybe. Not everybody because if you were from this century or last century, you don't know the first, uh, what was the name of that movie with the, uh, I forgot, with the animals, dinosaurs, eggs, Jurassic Park, thank you. I couldn't, I couldn't remember. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to turn a butterfly into a tornado and vice versa. Just an example. Then I'm going to talk about linearization of a super integral system by means of hiddenly symmetries. What's wrong? <laughs> I know I make things very, very how can I say, entertaining, but I'm not at the point that I don't know why do you laugh for, <laughs> but that's okay. You'll tell me later. Then I'm going to talk about a famous phrase by Lagrange. Uh, is mechanics a branch of mathematical analysis? The role of the Jacobi last multiply is connection with first integral, Lagrangian, and least symmetries. Quantization, then, it's my last, uh, well, yeah, I think it's the last one because I would run out of time. Uh, quantization through the conservation of nether symmetries. And I don't think I, I have time to talk about uh, PT symmetry and the elimination of quantum bad ghosts by a nether symmetry ghostbuster. But maybe uh, it's gray because I don't know if I'll have time to talk about it. Let me start. Which symmetries? <laughs> That's the point, which symmetries? I mean, the previous speakers have touched the argument, this subject, so I'm going just to cite people. Here is Peter Olver's book. Uh, this is the first edition, then there was a second edition, Application of Lie Groups to Differential Equations, Springer Verlag, 1986. Uh, historically, the applications of Lie Group to Differential Equation pioneered by Lee and Nader, faded into obscurity, just as the global abstract reformulation of differential geometry by Rick Cartan gained its ascendancy in the mathematical community. 36 later, years later, and after hundreds of papers and many books have been published on this subject, the first by of Sianikov in 1962, more than half a century ago, Walter, a young analyst who studies PDEs, say partial differential equation, the only useful symmetry is dilation. They can be used to determine embedding into Sobolev or Lebesgue spaces, and all other ones are useless. Michael, a senior mathematical physicist, instead, he said, What are these symmetries? Uh, let me give you another citation, more recent. Hidden symmetry of, of dynamics in classical and quantum physics. Marco Cariglia was uh, publishing this paper in 2014. It was a review and quote, we point out that there exists another approach to the subject of hidden symmetries of the dynamics, which originates in the seminal work of Sophus Lee. 
Lee developed his theory of continuous group in order to find symmetries of differential equation that transform solution into solutions. The transformation act on both dependent and independent variable. Then he keeps talking about it, actually writing about it. And then he say, the theory of Lie group applied to differential equation can be cast in a form appropriate for Hamiltonian systems that is equivalent to the result we present. But in this review, however, we have chosen to adopt from the beginning the language of Hamiltonian system and phase space, which we think physicists and applied mathematicians might broadly consider as familiar territory. I am taking you into unfamiliar territory. Be aware. These two guys uh, are Carl Gustav Jakob Jacobis, uh, and uh, the other guy with the beard is Sophus Lee. Uh, Carl Gustav Jacob Jacobi's contribution to the study of linear first order partial differential equation inspired Sophus Lee. It was not only him, but uh, there is a book by Hawkins who uh, won a prize many years ago, and it was about the birth of uh, group theory and uh, league group theory. Uh, who got convinced that any integration technique for ordinary differential equations meant the existence of certain groups of symmetry, known as Lie algebra or Lie groups nowadays. Lie methods has been successfully applied in different problems in physics. However, it, was a, it has a major drawback when applied to system of first order equations. I'm giving you a bit of math, sorry. Ordinary differential equation of first order. I'm giving you the first differential equation that one encounters in any undergraduate program that touch math. Uh, this gamma is a differential, linear differential operator, and it's <coughs> called nowadays the Lie operator. Uh, Lie, of course, call it the group operator, but anyhow, he his first prolongation, it's easy done by, oh, sorry, oops, uh, by this gamma one. Uh, I'm a bit, let me go this way. Ah, here we go. Uh, but if I go this way, you can't hear me. Okay, forget it. Uh, gamma, generates, uh, gamma generates a Lie point symmetry for equation uh, y prime equal uh, fxy or y prime minus fxy equals zero, where f is an arbitrary function for the time being of x and y. And I don't put any theoretical analysis uh, property on f. Uh, anybody can uh, look at Cauchy theorem just in case. If and only if the prolongation of gamma applied to this h equation along when h is equal to zero is equal to zero, this yields the following undetermined determining equation. I want to point out that this is an equation, a partial differential equation, linear. Even if the equation to start with y prime minus fxy equals zero was nonlinear in f, but it's uh, underdetermined. I have two unknowns and one equation, so it's useless. And it has an infinite number of solution. But if you are lucky enough to find one particular solution, then there is a link between uh, Lie symmetry and an integrating factor or an Euler uh, multiplier, as was used to be called at the time, because he made it, uh, and to solve this uh, first order ODE and uh, the link is in the formula, in the frame formula. Infinite solution means nothing. That's the, the major drawback of such a problem. Let me give an example from Leonard Euler and himself. Uh, he was looking at this in this paper, he was looking at this equation and uh, it's a first order equation, and he found the integrating factor. Uh, he didn't write it in this way, because at the time you would have had uh, differentials, not derivatives, of course, in his paper, but I wrote it in the modern time. 
in the form of the modern time. And uh, you have uh, this integrating factor. So from this integrating factor, you can have this least symmetry from the formula above, before. A first order OD, I repeat it, admits an infinite dimensional least symmetry algebra. But increasing the order decreases the dimension. So if you have, and I don't go into the glorious details, just to give you a glimpse of what it means to find a transformation that acts on the dependent independent variable. It means to do something very, how can I say, algorithmically. It's very easy to do it. And nowadays, of course, with computer algebra, it's even easier because you don't have to do it by hand. And uh, uh, you get the second prolongation because you have to act on the second derivative if you have uh, a second order differential equation. And here again, uh, the second prolongation, apply it to the equation. When the equation is equal zero, equal zero gives you another determining equation, which is overdetermined. Because of course, y prime, y prime, as you can see, is given by this equation. And so f, contains y prime. So you can, uh, this is something that is equal to zero. Before you have two unknowns and one equation. Here you have more than one equation because y prime has to be free. Otherwise you have a first order equation, not the second order equation. So whatever is the coefficient of y prime should be zero. Uh, and the maximum number calculated by Sophus Lee of a simple second order differential equation is eight. So eight transformation are the maximum number of, I call, and not me only, leap point symmetries, which are transformation of x and y that leaves the equation invariant. So it takes solution into solution. Having symmetry means solving the problem. I haven't talked about conservation law yet. Here is the example of the butterfly. Uh, this is uh, Edward Norton Lawrence. And in 1972, he gave this famous talk entitled Predictability. Does the flap of a butterfly wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? And he was talking about uh, the left, the left picture for you, which is uh, these uh, things that could be thought to be the butterfly wings. And on the other side, you have a sort of a twister, more than a tornado maybe, but anyhow. Let me give you how to go with symmetry from one to the other. Lee symmetry can transform a butterfly into a tornado and a tornado into a butterfly. This was a long 20, whatever, 20 years ago paper of mine. Lorentz system is the red one. It's a three first order ODEs. If I had the problem with one first order ODE that I have infinite symmetry, I cannot find algorithmically not even one, the things get worse if I have a system of first order equation. We are used to teach the student that you can take an equation of order n and transform it into a system of n first order equation, ordinary differential equation. And they are the same. It's not true. In terms of symmetry, it's not true. While a second order differential equation have a maximum of eight symmetry, no more two second order, sorry, two first order ODEs that comes from the second order have an infinite number of symmetry. Get that. Now, uh, in this case, this was uh, very simple. There was an integral case with the sigma tilde, r tilde, b tilde are the parameter that were in this model. They were, this model was derived by Lawrence uh, in 63, for, uh, yeah, it's, it's written there, 1963. And uh, it was, uh, it was a meteorologist, not the Lawrence that was uh, mentioned before. And uh, he uh, noticed that there was something wrong uh, in changing the initial condition of this problem. And he was numerically trying to solve it at the time. Uh, but Segur, I say in 1980, found uh, some uh, uh, 
solution of this problem for particular value of these parameters. And one of them is this third order OD, this e equation, I mean system, as you can see, sigma tilde is one over two, R tilde is zero, and B tilde is one. And the corresponding third order equation gives you two symmetries. Of course, I say second order, maximum is eight, third order, maximum is n plus four, so it's seven, but actually you have just two symmetries. Of course, if you write the equivalent system like it's written there of three first order equation, how many symmetries? An infinite number, forget it. But now by raising the order, you get two symmetry. What can you do with these two symmetries? Nothing for the time being. Well, you could integrate it in terms of elliptic function. Okay, fine. But, uh, see, I teach mechanics, rational mechanics, analytical mechanics. Rational mechanics comes from Newton uh, and before him from Pappus, but anyhow. And uh, he, Euler uh, had this uh, famous book about uh, uh, rigid bodies. Now, I was trying to think in English, but I come in Italian, and so it's a bit confusing to me to talk in, in Latin if I talk in English. But anyhow, fun enough. Uh, and this is the case of a rigid body with a fixed point uh, free from torsion. That's what we would call it. And it's called the Euler Poinceau system. And uh, he, uh, there is, uh, you can actually integrate this one, it's integral, and uh, the third order equation admits two symmetries. Here they are. And uh, dt and uh, this t dt minus p dp uh, scaling. And then uh, you can look at those two with the previous one, and they are the same. The same algebra, Lie algebra. It's type four in Lie's classification of the real uh, two-dimensional Lie algebra in two variables. Number four, there were four only, so two abelian and two non-abelian. So you can link them. You can put together those, and you can go from one to the other one. And this is the transformation, tau x, y, in terms of t, q, p, q, and r. Now, uh, there is also, which probably at the time I confused people by doing it, but there was also a link between uh, the inertial momenta. So do you see this b and a and c to make it match. And the transformation goes from one, and then you can invert it. I want to show you, actually point out to you that there is a transformation of time. And time, the transformation is inverting the time, and also there is an exponential, so things are not quite physical. What happens if one applied the above transformation to the general Lorentz system? This is the El Euler Poinceau system with this B transform. And you can see that now I have, uh, with this transformation, I have a momentum, which depends by the components of uh, the angular velocity and time, by the way. And here is a tornado. So if you do the numerical with the same type of uh, uh, parameters to this one, because you see inside that uh, equation, now you have the R tilde, B tilde, and so on, you get the tornado. So, and there is no chaos, because whatever was the problem is now in the eye of the twister. So just the beginning, well, I move forward and I don't take the same. So this is a bit of a joke. Let me see a bit more in deep what a complete symmetry is. This was an idea, but I don't know if it was completely original, by Krauss in 94. He extended a notion of symmetry in mechanics uh, and uh, to characterize a classical system by the symmetry law it obeys. Namely, different mechanical systems cannot have exactly the same symmetry property. And when I talk symmetry, I talk about transformation. But to do that, introduce no local symmetries. And as you can see, this Y, this red color formula, you have an integral, psi in dt. And then he applied that to the Kepler's problem, and he got three non-local symmetry of the Kepler problem, two-body problem, the usual one. 
And, uh, and they are this, I just put one, Y1, but you can put Y2 and exchange X1 with X2. And then the next one, you took all the permutation. I was curious about it. When I see that, I look for hidden symmetries. Which are the hidden symmetries in this case? Transform the system of three ordinary differential equation, capital problem, in six. Hamiltonian equation or six first order equation anyhow, and then, re and then do what uh, Jacobi taught us to do when he was solving the Euler-Lagrange top. <coughs> what did he do? Well, I mean, the, the equation are autonomous. There is no time. So why bother to take time? Take one of the dependent variable as the new independent variable. And if you do that, you get the, the system, sorry, the symmetry that were with the integral are not anymore with the integral, are just point symmetries of the underline, underline equations. Uh, great. I go to another subject now, superintegrability and hidden symmetry. I assume, I assume, but I'm not sure uh, now, that uh, uh, Liouville theorem about integrability is one of the basics of Hamiltonian mechanics. And uh, uh, Liouville, actually it was not Liouville really, but I leave that to the historian. Uh, there was another paper, and, uh, but Liouville said, well, I did it too, but I'm happy to have the young one to publish it in my journal which was the Jules de Mathematique, the pure and applied mathematics. And uh, uh, he said, if you have an autonomous Hamiltonian system, and you have, uh, so you have, say, 2n, twice number n integer, number of equations, and you know n first integrals, n conservation law of the system, then uh, you can integrate the system completely. And I'm not going into the glorious detail uh, that uh, this first integral have to have uh, their Poisson bracket to be zero, two by two, and if, they, I mean, if it's independent, they have to be independent of time, that's the major thing. Or oh, everything independent of time. Of course, I'm not going to the Uville Arnold theorem, uh, which means that I have to have uh, a torus because the system of the n first integral autonomous are actually a connect space and a compact space. So this is more into the topological argument or in differential geometry, if you like. But anyhow, superintegrability was born in uh, quantum mechanics. It was not born in uh, classical mechanics. And, uh, but there are a lot of, uh, produce a lot of papers, even in classical mechanics, and we see some of it. I just point out this one because it comes out from uh, a, a paper by Drach, D-R-A-C-H, uh, in the 1930s, and uh, one of these cases uh, is the one that I, show you here that was discussed by uh, Sarah Post and Pavel Winternitz in this paper in 2011. And then I decided to involve Sarah Post. We were on the train going from one point, from one conference to the other conference, say, let's look at this from the point of view of hidden symmetry. You have uh, Hamiltonian equation, u one dot, u two dot, blah, blah, blah. Four equation, first order, how many Lee symmetry? Infinite. Okay, right. There are two first integral. They already found two first integral. That's why it's super integral, because the Hamiltonian also is a first integral, a conservation law. And they are all autonomous, and this, the Poisson brackets is zero, they are invariant. Okay, fine. What's about property of this system? I'm going to show that this system through hidden symmetries actually, ah, and it's not separate. I mean, the hamilton jacobi equation for whoever is a bit familiar with that does not separate in any coordinates. That's important. 
So, and you look at these first, two first integer, you are scared. There are u, one to two, third. How are you going to solve it? Okay, let's go back to the Lagrangian equation of this system. Two second order equation. They have only two symmetry. We know it. Okay, dt gives you the Hamiltonian. The other one is actually the damn, sorry if I say that word, scaling that never gives you anything. Unfortunate. We need it, of course. Uh, since systems like that, the previous one, the Hamiltonian, or the, if you like, the four first order equation, is autonomous, we can choose one of the dependent variables as the new independent variable. Uh, for example, u1. And here is, instead of four equations, I have three equations of first order. Already, it's impossible. Eliminating one of the dependent variables, for example, from the second equation, then the system becomes this ugly stuff. But this ugly stuff emits 10, 10 Lie symmetry. And which implies the system one is linearizable. And to go further and finish it up like that and keep going, it's with the next topic, uh, is actually this. It hides a third order linear equation, a trivial one. And you can go back and do the symmetries for the uh, system. But since I am running out of time, forget. I was going to show you that you can get conservation low without the Nader theorem, thanks to Jacobi. Uh, I've done other things uh, with uh, other people, Peter Lee, Giorgio Gubbiotti, so to show that there is linearity underneath superintegrability, thanks to hidden symmetry. Going down, check for them, find them. So, uh, for example, are all super uh, today somebody was mentioned on Euclidean spaces. Even in the case of non-Euclidean spaces, you can find linearity, linear equation underneath it all, these super integral cases. Uh, look at this, for example, this ugly Hamiltonian. You can imagine how ugly are the equation. And uh, now with the Rudby Campoamor, uh, we have already gone into three-dimensional Euclidean space and find out they are actually all linearized, the ones that were found by Evans uh, in 1990. I know, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to fire them off, all of them, and find the linearity that it's underneath all this superintegrable system. Let me skip all of that because it's okay. Lagrange, just that. In uh, the avertisement of the mechanique analytique, I think that uh, the third, this, uh, the, sorry, I forgot the name. <laughs> the second speaker today was mentioning Lagrange, but he was mentioning mechanique without an H. The, the H one was the first edition. And in the first edition, Lagrange said, the mythos they are explaining it require neither construction nor geometric or mechanical argument, but only the algebraic operation inherent to a regular and uniform process. Those who love analysis will with joy see mechanics become a new branch of it and will be grateful to me for thus having extended this field. Sorry, it's a joke. Come on, it's a joke, isn't it? Isn't it? No, it's not. Jacobi last multiply. We forgot about Jacobi last multiple. Now it's coming back, uh, lucky, I mean, also because of, of me looking at these things. And uh, Jacobi last multiplier is a multiplier that links two things that are zero, okay? And this multiplier, remember one of the reviewer didn't understand what I was doing, of course, and instead of looking at things, uh, he said, well, why bother? You are doing uh, complicating the stuff. No, I'm not. Because uh, if I have two, two multiplier and solving this equation, their ratio is the first integral. And how many Lagrangian does one know? Okay, Mr. Jacobi told us that a multiplier can give you a Lagrangian for a second order equation. So how many second order equation, how many Lagrangian for one second order equation you can find an infinite number? <laughs> Forget physics. Enter Lee, and that's important because otherwise, how do you find the, sol you know, the, the solution of this Jacobi-Lass multiplier equation? Lee was studying his work, 
and he put that into context with symmetry. So just give you a simple example, x w dot equals zero. It has eight symmetries, okay? Two first equations, just because first order, it has infinite, but we just take eight. And with eight, we just calculate two by two, all these determinant. A determinant will give you a Jacobi last multiplier and actually conservation law as well. But look how many Lagrangian you get. You get about 10 Lagrangian. And finally, you get the true Lagrangian. So how do you physically eliminate nine out of 10? Okay, this is easy because it's a second order differential equation everybody knows. No, how do you do it really? Uh, you call uh, Agatha Christie, I think, that in the theater in Oxford there is the mousetrap. No, they differ by the number of nether symmetries that they admit. The physical Lagrangian admit the maximum number of nether symmetry, which is five. However, also other two Lagrangian have five nether symmetries. So how do you eliminate? Well, you ask Nader and Schrodinger, and Schrodinger will help you. I, I'm going over time, so I'm just going to tell you how to do quantization, going from classical to quantum mechanics. And when I say quantum mechanics, I just say, I'm not going to be bothered, I'm just searching for a time-dependent trading equation, okay? And it's known. What is known? Well, if you look at the symmetries of a partial differential equation, which is the Schrodinger equation for, uh, uh, this one, the simplest for, uh, Schrodinger equation, the blue one, the simple. Well, you see the x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5 are nothing else than the nether symmetry of the true Lagrangian of x w dot equals zero. So you can actually use that, plus you have, because it's linear, you have, uh, uh, you know, one uh, alpha uh, deep psi transformation, of course, it's linked to the solution of the Schrodinger equation, but that's not the point. The point you can go, well, Marcos Moschinsky was, uh, I think uh, he uh, won the Wigner medal. I know, I know he won the Wigner medal. The first one to win the Wigner medal was uh, Wigner, and then the second one was uh, uh, Marcos Moschinsky. How to obtain the Schrodinger equation? Same thing. So how do you quantize? You find the least symmetry of the Lagrange equation. You find the nether symmetry. Construct the Schrodinger equation admitting those least symmetry, look, in the space and time part. And then the psi part will come. Plus the usual quantize preserving the symmetries. An example, I give an example from population dynamics. Today, I mean, a few months ago, I've seen some uh, announcement in the Mathematical Institute about two postgraduate uh, being hit on the road to North Shore Diet, which is uh, the place where uh, Sophus Lee was born, so can't say on the way to Damascus. And uh, they uh, wrote a paper how to, uh, in a way, exclude between two models in cancer, which one has the best symmetry. And when it talks about symmetry, they talk about the model and they talk about least symmetries. And I'm very, very happy about it because I wrote a paper applying symmetry to biomathematic epidemics and it was always rejected. Of course, that was last century. So now, of course, we are not. So this is the complete symmetric group of this equation that comes from uh, a uh, biological point of view, but is any equation. And uh, you can actually write, uh, because of the complete symmetry group, a precise Schrodinger equation for this equation. I'm not going about all the other one in more than one uh, variable, of course. It's the same, you can find that. And I'm just going to finish because, ah, that's the last one. You remember that I was talking about the three Lagrangian for the x w dot equals zero. How do we eliminate the wrong Lagrangian? I say neither is not enough, but Schrodinger may help. Well, if you take the one that we know is the right Lagrangian, 
1 over 2 x dot square, you get, uh, applied by this meter, you get the right uh, uh, Schrodinger equation. What happened with the other ones? Well, one will invert space with time. It's a simple mathematical joke, I think, talking about Lagrangian making a joke. And the other one takes you back to the original classical equation. So I think I'll finish here because my time is gone. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have a little bit of time for questions. If anybody wants to pick up anything. I bet I shock everybody. I think you may have done. <laughs> All right. Well, I have a question on the Lorenz equation. Lorenz was worried about predictability. I mean, do, does the existence of those symmetries shed any light on the predictability question, or are we asking a different question? This one was just, uh, a, you know, a, a way to, f to put together by symmetry two equations in two different fields. Because uh, that, uh, by accident, I'm sorry to say, that was quite by accident. Because I just look at the two things and I say, hey, wait a minute, this seems to be the same algebra, and that's why. And then when I did the numerical of the chaotic case with the flap, with the butterfly, I get this twist. <laughs> so um, that's it. And, and there's one uh, editor put it up. It's very interesting, but there's no physical application. Can't help it. <laughs> Chance for questions? I think I shock everybody with the mathematics. I, I think you that. have. Uh, but uh, yes. Actually, I have a question. Um, so thank you very much for this talk. I, I wanted to ask um, how many hidden symmetries in the physical systems do you th think we have? Because it seems that I know that you haven't named them, but in physics we are aware of a few of them, like you know, in Kepler problem, like two-body problem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are not too many of them. Do you think that there are exists thousands they are of them there. that we are not aware of them or not? They are there. The problem is, okay, let me give you an example. You, are, uh, you know that uh, there was the golden rush. Sometime there is a golden rush for something. And people run to buy the, la the last iPhone uh, 22, okay? Now, the point is you go and stay online overnight in the only shop in town that sells iPhone 22. Then you arrive there and they say, we have finished it. Chat, boom. And you are, you're helpless at that point. The same thing is with symmetries. Symmetries are there. They are underneath. We don't know how to find them. That's the point. So one of the ways to find them is this idea of transforming the equation. See, one of the things that it's sort of, and here we were talking about different models in physics, and I'm sorry if I go the other way. I said, why do you want to, to be stuck with it? Why don't you look instead of the symmetry, like the young people here have done, which I'm very happy, stuck with the symmetry. The complete symmetry group, for example, is a very interesting question. Some years ago, there was a paper in, I think it was science, I'm not sure it was nature, it was one paper and, and the guy said, let's get rid of equation, let's get rid of differential equation in physics. It was this paper, I mean, it was published. Well, in a way, with a complete symmetry group, you don't need the equation, because the, the only problem is that the comp you have to find them. Ha, that's a good question. Of course, why... Why do you want to stop doing research? Let's find them, number one. And number two, when you have that, you don't have one representation, you have plenty of other representation, maybe. And you have to be sure, but you have to be sure that that equation is represented by those symmetries and not by other symmetries, because otherwise you get nothing. And the point is, I mean, uh, Naili Bragimo was, unfortunately, I used the word was, he died a few years ago, and he was used to say, chercher, I mean, my French is nil, so chercher le groupe. So instead of chercher la femme, chercher le groupe. Or chercher le, le comme si, how do you say men in French? That's funny, I don't know, men? <laughs> so, and, uh, and 
the point is that it's been always, I mean, there are a lot of people, for example, Hans Stefani in Germany, he was a general relativity, and suddenly he found out about symmetry. And he wrote the book. These two postgraduate students, one from Sweden, one from uh, here, I think, they were both in, in Oxford. They just found in uh, August, uh, so it's very recent, it's in the website. This idea, they, they found out about symmetry. They didn't know anything about symmetry because it's not part of the education. And I am very, very, very uh, upset about it because you missed a tool. Who was talking about different tools? Why do you want to use the usual tool? There are tools there. I mean, Einstein used a tool that was already there, right? Levi Civita was the expert of that tool, and he didn't know. I mean, then in the end, he said the only one who understood general relativity was Levi Civita, and not by accident. I hope I replied to your question, or I answer it somehow. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have a question down the front here. So, um, just time for a quick question and answer, I think. In several uh, examples, you showed us that uh, hidden symmetries uh, can uh, uh, lead to um, the uh, um, uh, linearization of the equations. And that means, in the end, to the solvability and the computability of the problems. So uh, my question is, um, how much is the influence of these symmetry arguments in algorithmic theory nowadays, computation. That means uh, what may be the help of uh, these hidden symmetries for, in the end, for computer science? I don't like to touch the computer I don't like to touch artificial, you're talking about artificial intelligence. Linearization means uh, uh, you can solve in the end uh, the problem and uh, it's, uh, it's computable uh, in the end. Uh, which may not be uh, the case uh, uh, if uh, it's highly complicated. And that is uh, uh, due to uh, the uh, uh, discovery of hidden symmetries. I, I thought that was the uh, message of, your, uh, of a part of your talk. And so my idea is um, uh, to, uh, uh, to analyze how much is the influence of uh, symmetry uh, arguments to uh, computability in general. How can it be uh, helpful for uh, uh, computer scientists, for example, uh, to solve very complicated problems in order to make them relevant. Well, I must admit that you're touching a very, very uh, dangerous uh, terrain because uh, it's a quagmire. Because uh, there are scientists, computer scientists with artificial intelligence, they are saying, we'll give up with the brain. We'll give up the human brain. And so they think that they just by putting data in the, in the computer, they can get uh, Kepler, uh, well, I don't know, say something, Schrodinger equation, no, it's too easy maybe. Or, uh, uh, where are you? Maxwell uh, equation, electrodynamic. They can get everything just by feeding up the computer with data. I raise my hand and I say, I still, I, it's like uh, to have, uh, how can I say, an unknown, a quagmire there. I'm not know anything about it. I don't want to be involved with it. I let everybody who wants to be involved with it, but not me. I am, uh, I am more into the human brain, and I don't think, and it's not my human brain. It's not only your human brain. It's everybody here in this room, because science is collaboration. It's not pushing a button in a computer, sorry. I mean, for me. As one of the computer scientists in the room, um, uh, maybe that's, I should stick up. No, that's support. what I say. It's but, yeah. collaboration. But I'm yeah. talking to computer scientists who are saying, I feed up the computer with data analysis, with data, and then I get Kepler. Good. Yeah. OK, well, let's, let's thank you for those uh, answers. And, say uh, nothing. Thank the speaker, and we'll thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.